Okay, hi everyone and welcome to the One Health seminar series. The series is organized by the University of Guelph One Health Institute um, and graduate students enrolled in the One Health collaborative specialization. My name is Radhika Gandhi and I'm an MSc student in the Department of Population Medicine and also one of the One Health students. It's my pleasure to be facilitating the first seminar of the 2021 academic year. To start things off, I'd like to acknowledge that we are here today on land that has been inhabited by Indigenous people of Turtle Island who have made significant contributions to strengthening our community, province, and country as a whole. In particular, we acknowledge that the University of Guelph resides on the ancestral land of the Atawandaran people and the treaty lands and territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We uphold the significance of the Dish with One Spoon Covenant to respect the land's offerings and the peoples sharing this territory. We recognize that this gathering place and all the places that we are joining from today is still home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. As an individual who has settled on Turtle Island, I am grateful for the opportunities this land has provided me with and want to thank all of the generations who have taken care of it for thousands of years. This acknowledgement is meant to remind us of our collective responsibility to this place and its people's histories, rights, and presence. We must support and honor our Indigenous communities by investing in Indigenous education, equitable health care, and access to clean water. Furthermore, I want to bring attention to September 30th, which marks our first truth, National Truth and Reconciliation Day. The University of Guelph supports the call to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Committee on Indian Residential Schools to never forget to hold governments and colonial forces to account and to seek redress and healing for injustice. I ask that we take some time to read the call to action and wear orange on September 30th to support our Indigenous communities. Before I introduce our speakers today, I wish to inform you that we are recording this seminar. The recording will be posted to the One Health YouTube channel and a link will be made available on the One Health Institute website. The recording may also be used by the One Health Institute in context of promoting and showcasing One Health work being done on our campus. If you have any questions or concerns about the recording or One Health generally, please contact us at onehealth at uoguelph.ca. At the, at the end of the seminar, there will be time for questions and a discussion. You can ask your question either by raising your hand and when invited by the facilitator, asking your question or by typing your question in the chat. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Maureen Anderson is a lead veterinarian for animal health and welfare in the veterinary science unit at the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Bree Walpole is a senior policy advisor with the Biodiversity and Invasive Species Section at the Ontario Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry. Together, Maureen and Bree are going to be talking to us about One Health Wild Pigs. And yes, I did that, say that correctly. It's about wild pigs. Off to you, Maureen. Great. Um, thanks for the introduction and thank you everybody for coming and just before I share my screen while I can still see everybody's little box I just thought I would ask the question, how many of you have ever heard of wild pigs or knew that we had wild pigs in Ontario, and if, can anybody just put their little like reaction hand up I don't know if anybody knows how to do that, but I'd be very curious to see anybody anybody I got a couple. That's good. Oh, there's there's a few more popping up. That's good. Good. Okay, great. Okay, so some people have heard of this. That's great. Excellent. Um, I was going to say, you're all going to know, hopefully, a whole lot more by the end of this presentation. And share. Somebody let me know when the slides pop up. Good? Yes, that's yeah. perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so um, wild pigs. Yes, we are going to talk about wild pigs as a one health problem. So first of all, Bree and I are going to talk about what wild pigs actually are. Um, and then we'll talk about how wild pigs fit in as a one health uh, problem, aka why wild pigs are really bad. Um, and where in uh, North America we can find wild pigs. Uh, the presentation is very um, sort, of North, sort of North America centric and we'll get into reasons for that later. Um, and then we will also talk about uh, means of preventing and controlling wild pigs at the end and uh, hopefully have some time for discussion at the end and questions. So again, I can't see all of your hands and all that sort of stuff, but I put this in as a little quiz. 
So in your mind, look at these three pictures of pigs and side, which one you think is actually a wild pig, A, B, or C. And no matter what you answered, you're actually at least partly correct and partly incorrect because the actual answer is that all of these can be wild pigs. What defines a wild pig is that it has to be a pig, basically of any kind, um, that is found outside of a fence or outside of the control of a human being, basically. Um, so any of these could actually be wild pigs. None of them are shown as um, being contained or confined. They're out in fields, out on the roadside. Um, so these are actually all pictures of wild pigs. The top one obviously is a Eurasian wild boar as per the caption. Um, and that's what people think of classically as a, a wild pig. And they are sort of the ancestral version of pigs um, that have their original home range through much of Eurasia. Um, but the middle one is a pot-bellied pig and the bottom, one, bottom photo is pictures of what we would consider sort of our, our classic domestic raised for meat um, pigs that we would find on, on any swine farm uh, in or most swine farms in Ontario. Um, but because these are all the same species, right? All of these, despite the fact that they look different, right? Just like, just like you can have vastly different breeds of dogs, but they can all interbreed. You can have vastly different looking pigs. And again, they can all interbreed. So these are all the same species. They're all Suscrofa. Um, so you can have a mixture of any of the characteristics in these pigs um, and have it be a wild pig. And people often thought, you know, well, you know, pink, pink domestic pigs, you know, really don't survive well in the wild. They actually survive quite well. And we'll talk about that too. But um, so you can have wild pigs that are pink with thin hair, spotted, striped, um, dark with that really thick hair, like the Eurasian wild boar at the top. And a classic Eurasian wild boar might be 150 or 200 pounds. Um, when they get crossbred with some of our larger domestic swine, not unusual to find them uh, topping 400, 500, 600 plus pounds. So they can, they, these can turn into enormous animals depending on how they've been crossbred. To give you a brief history of wild pigs, again, in North America, they're not native to this continent. Uh, pigs were probably first brought over by Spanish settlers, um, sort of Florida, Southern US area. Um, and they, they effectively deliberately set these pigs loose because that way they didn't need, the pigs would survive on their own and then they could basically hunt them for food. Um, so it provided them with a food source without actually having to farm them. Um, but of course they didn't realize the problems that might potentially cause further down the line. Uh, in Canada specifically, we imported a fair bit of Eurasian wild boar for farming and other purposes in the 1980s and 90s. Um, it was supposed to be sort of a little bit of a niche market that you could buy and eat wild boar as opposed to regular pork. Um, but when they brought them over, like I said, traditional Eurasian wild boar are a little bit smaller. They don't have the high reproductive rates that our domestic swine have. So they were crossbred for for performance characteristics to make bigger pigs, more meat, more and more uh, piglets. Um, and then that market never really took off. So unfortunately, um, there were some people who lost, kind of lost their shirts on it. Uh, and animals um, sometimes escaped because these, these pigs were often raised sort of outdoors as opposed to in the more traditional uh, enclosed, well, I don't know if you call it traditional now, but sort of modern day enclosed um, intensive swine operations. Um, so some of them escaped. Um, some of them were basically intentionally released um, when they weren't really worth keeping anymore. Um, and they easily adapted to a lot of different landscapes. And again, what happened is a lot of the pigs that are out in the wild because of this crossbreeding are sort of this crossbred super pig that has survival characteristics of Eurasian wild boar, reproductive characteristics of a farmed pig. Um, but again, I will emphasize that any pig, um, for the most part, they, they're capable of surviving in the wild um, quite well, depending on what situation they're in. Again, we'll talk about that. Wild pigs in one health. This is why we care about wild pigs, because they are considered one of the most prolific and invasive and successful um, species on the planet. And they don't just cause problems for one sector or one group or one type of, or one group of livestock, they cause problems for everybody. So they are a great example of a one health problem. The number one issue uh, 
we have with them, particularly in North America, um, and especially down in the States, is actually the damage they do to crops and uh, plant agriculture. And it's been estimated that in the US, damage and control of wild pigs costs over $1.5 billion annually. And that's actually an old estimate. It's probably closer to two, two and a half billion every year for the damage done by these pigs. Um, and it likely is underreported, but the key is that these pigs don't just destroy the crop. So it's not like deer where they, you know, just eat the corn or eat the crop. They actually destroy the ground that the crop is planted on. So they will go through and root through a field uh, and make it extremely hard to actually replant that field. And a relatively small group of pigs can destroy a 10 to 12 acre field overnight. And it looks like a cluster bomb has gone off. And the, the photo on the slide is a perfect example. And there's been a huge amount of investment actually in the US to get pigs under control, wild pigs under control as a result of the amount of damage that they are able to do to crops. But of course, they are also a risk to animal agriculture and even to people. They can, they can be extremely aggressive animals. They really do not have fear of anything. Um, you'll see in some later slides, they're sometimes referred to as a poor man's grizzly. Like they will, they will, <laughs> if you shoot at a group of pigs and you shoot at one, the other pigs in the group are as likely to charge at the person who shot the first pig as they are to actually run away in some cases, as an example. Um, but these animals are actually predators. They will kill small livestock like calves, um, goat kids, lambs. They harass larger livestock, so they will deter uh, beef cattle, for example, from coming up to feeders and just generally stress out animals that are out on pasture because they're afraid of the pigs and they don't want to be near them and the pigs, you know, sort of take no prisoners. Um, and this is always the picture that gets everybody is the wild boar basically running away with Bambi in his mouth if you didn't really believe me that they would kill small livestock. So there you go. And the picture on the right is an example of their tusks. Um, these tusks are basically self-sharpening. They are rubbing against each other constantly um, and they are razor, razor sharp and obviously can be quite deadly and can be very dangerous if you get into an altercation with a pig, whether you're an animal or a person. And then of course, there's the damage they cause to natural ecosystems. So the same way they can destroy a, an agricultural field, they can destroy um, sensitive and sometimes not so sensitive habitats as well because they, are, they can be so destructive. They're, they're significant competition for resources. These can be very big animals. They take a lot of resources um, and they can, they're generalists when it comes to their diet and where they live, they can, they'll actually eat large numbers of reptiles and amphibians. Uh, they destroy ground nests uh, and they also can have effects on water quality through again, wallowing, um, trampling and rooting and all that sort of stuff and contaminating um, water sources, all bad things. They also have a role to play in disease transmission. And again, this isn't just between pigs, um, although they are, the, they are the, probably arguably the greatest risk to the swine industry because anything a domestic pig can get um, can also infect a wild pig and can be transmitted between the two, again, because they're all the same species. But some of these diseases are actually zoonotic uh, and some can be transmitted to other species as well. So in the US, the top diseases that they monitor are brucellosis, swine brucellosis, pseudorabies, which is a virus not related to actual rabies, um, tularemia, and classical swine fever, which is a foreign animal disease, which fortunately they, they haven't found to date. Um, but there are lots of other concerns. Influenza A, right? We all know pigs can get that, and they're the, the great mixing pot of influenzas. Wild pigs can get that too. Leptospirosis, circovirus, PERS virus. They found bovine TB in wild pigs. Basically, Anything, like I said, anything that a pig can get at some point they have found in wild pig populations in one place or another. And of course, top of mind right now um, are some of the foreign animal diseases, foot and mouth, sure, but African swine fever is the one that everybody is really worried about right now because um, it has been circulating quite rampantly uh, through a lot of Asia, especially in China and a lot of Europe. And even though this disease does not infect people, um, getting it in the swine industry in North America would have devastating effects on the swine industry and ripple effects um, on the livelihoods and food livelihoods of tons of people, food security, all those sorts of things. And we saw 
we had a taste of that with the COVID pandemic, um, when we had processing plants that were shut down because of COVID outbreaks and all that sort of stuff and the backup that it caused through um, the swine industry, which is a just in time sort of supply industry. Um, so closing borders uh, due to export restrictions, if we were to get this disease, would have massive repercussions. Uh, and it's really important to note that in Eurasia especially, um, wild pigs have played a very important role in disease spread in these countries uh, and transmission between um, domestic operations especially. And speaking to that, again, if we have the if we have a disease that's in wild pigs, you know, what are the chances it's actually going to come in contact with domestic pigs? Well, it's pretty good because wild pigs can be extremely elusive. Um, oftentimes they, they adapt to only coming out at night so that they're avoiding people. Um, so you may not even see them and you have to kind of be aware of the signs that there have been pigs in the area sometimes. Sometimes they're obvious, right, when they've torn up a field, sometimes maybe less so. They have an excellent sense of smell though and they're attracted into commercial facilities because there are other pigs there, they smell the manure, there's spilled feed, that attracts them in, all that sort of thing. So they're likely to come right up to a barn if they're in the area, even if they can't get into the barn itself. Um, and again, these pigs are smart and they are strong. They can, nobody ever believes it, which is why I include this picture on the slide. Pigs can jump high, like a, a meter and a half high fence. And if they can't jump over it, they can dig under the fence. Cause again, they're really strong and they're really good at rooting. That's what they do. Or they'll just go right through the fence. So literally over, under, or through. Um, so fencing requirements for pigs to either keep them in or keep them out um, can be a little bit daunting. Um, so you, if you have wild pigs, there's risk of indirect contact, even with a closed herd in a modern day facility, because uh, you can get fecal contamination tracked into the barn um, if your biosecurity isn't totally up to snuff. And you can have direct contact with other kinds of pigs, particularly uh, backyard farming has become very popular and smaller, smaller uh, hold operations, organic farms, there's actually a requirement for the pigs to have a certain amount of outdoor access. Um, there are some people that are trying to raise pigs on pasture, and those animals in particular are at much higher risk of coming into contact with wild pigs if there are any in the area. So the keys to success of wild pigs. Um, if you had to design an invasive species, this one, <laughs> this is like, if you had designed the perfect invasive species, this one ticks a lot of the boxes. So they have early sexual maturity. They can start reproducing at six months of age. Um, very high reproductive rates, especially if they've been crossbred, but they will have, you know, at least a couple of litters a year, sometimes more. They have a relatively long lifespan. They're extremely intelligent. As I said, um, they, they're not naturally nocturnal, but when there's human activity in the area and they figure out if I'm out during the day, I'm going to get shot at or harassed or chased off, they just start coming out at night. So most wild pigs have actually become nocturnal in areas like that. Um, highly adaptive very mobile, they can actually move relatively large distances, habitat generalists, opportunistic diet, as I mentioned, they will eat just about anything. They do have their favorites, corn being one of them, and we have lots of that in Southern Ontario, um, but they can survive just about anywhere on just about anything, and they have very few to no natural predators, again, because they're an invasive species, they're not supposed to be here. Uh, we don't have a lot of predators that could handle a full-size wild pig. So that means that once they get established, they can be very, very difficult to eradicate. And now I'm going to turn it over to Bree, and she's going to tell us about where pigs are in North America. Great. Thanks, Maureen. So at the beginning of the pre presentation, Maureen asked, you know, who has heard of wild pigs or who knows about this issue? And a few people raised their hands. So if I were to hazard a guess, I would think most people who have heard about wild pigs have heard about um, established wild pig populations in the United States. There, I think they hit the media a lot. Um, we know there's a large um, wild pig hunting culture in the States. And so I think people are, are quite familiar anyways, or when you think about wild pigs in North America, you associate them with the States. And so here, I'm just gonna run through a few different figures that really show sort of the, the history and the spread of wild pigs in the USA. And so here you can see this figure shows feral swine uh, populations uh, in the States in 1982. And maybe actually at this point, this figure says feral swine. So I'll just mention this as well, <laughs> that wild pigs have a number of different names. And so when you do hear about them in the media, um, 
you know, you'll hear about wild pigs, wild hogs, feral swine, uh, things like that. And they're all talking about the same thing. So anyways, here's the first figure from 1982. And you can see, you know, there, there are some wild pig occurrences predominantly in the Southern states. And then the next slide. There we go. So here, 2004, you can see, you know, there's a lot of range expansion going on. And so a lot of those areas in the, in the South where we, they were just starting to see wild pigs in 1982, you can see they're really starting to spread and you're getting these discrete occurrences sort of as you move further North, that's demonstrating the expansion. And then the next one, again, here by 2019, you can see that they're, they're quite well established. And again, those discrete occurrences um, that were sort of in the mid states have now been fully filled in or filled in. And um, there's, there's a lot of wild pigs in those areas. And now next slide, perfect. So uh, there were some researchers at the University of Saskatchewan. So Ruth Ashram and Ryan Brook, and they um, knew what was going on in the United States. And they were starting to ask questions about, do we have wild pigs in Canada? And so they conducted a number of surveys um, and tried to figure out and locate any wild pigs here in the country. And so on this figure, you can see there's five little red dots. And those are actually, what they've highlighted there are watersheds that had a minimum of one occurrence of wild pigs within them. And this figure shows the data that they have between 1990 and the year 2000. And so on the next slide, or the next figure, <laughs> you can see, so again, this is the next decade, 2001 to 2010, there's a lot more red on that slide. So they're starting to find a lot more discrete populations um, or occurrences of wild pigs. And then if you wanna click the next one, Maureen, you can see this slide is gonna take us up to 2017. And I feel like it's just this textbook population explosion. So you can now see in the prairies, you don't just have these little dis discrete occurrences, but there's actually continuous established reproducing populations of wild pigs. You can see there's a few more occurrences in British Columbia. And also at this time, we received the first occurrences of wild pigs in both Ontario as well as Quebec. So you can hit the next slide, there we go. So around 2017, at, at the same time, uh, here with the, the ministry, uh, at that time was the MNR, Ministry of Natural Resources, we were receiving these anecdotal um, observations or accounts of wild pigs. So people would see a wild pig on the loose and report it to the ministry. And we were starting to wonder what was going on there. That combined with the research out of the University of Saskatchewan really made us um, want to learn more about, you know, what is the situation with wild pigs here in Ontario? And so what we did is we launched a pilot study and we used a citizen science approach to try and figure out um, where and how many wild pigs are in the province. And what that science or the citizen science approach entailed was we launched a communications campaign and developed an email address, which is wildpigs at ontario.ca, very easy to remember. And we asked for the support and participation of members of the public to please report any occurrences of wild pigs to the ministry. And I guess over the next few slides, I'll share what we learned. And so each of these slides have been divided up or the data that we um, acquired has been divided up into four different types of pigs. Uh, and so we have uh, the domesticated pigs on the top there. Those are your typical farm domesticated pigs. Um, there's also pot belly pigs, pigs that resemble Eurasian wild boar and unknown. So the figure on the top there I'll speak to first. And again, I should mention this data was collected between 2018 and 2020. Uh, and so you can see there's a number of sightings of pigs that re resemble these domestic farmed pigs. They're sort of scattered across the province. One thing that we did learn when we followed up on these sightings in particular is that in, in most cases, these um, domesticated sightings or sightings of domesticated pigs, we learned that they often returned to the farm that, where they came from or they were recaptured by their owner. Uh, on the bottom slide there, you can see the sightings we received of pigs that resembled potbelly pigs. I'll say the team was really surprised to find this. <laughs> we didn't realize that we had so many potbelly pigs out on the landscape in the province. And again, I think that most of the time you uh, associate potbelly pigs with pet pigs. They usually come from sort of residential areas or uh, pig um, sort of hobby farms and things like that. And again, when we followed up on those sightings, we learned that often these animals had, you know, escaped from their containment or escaped from their owners, but they were often recaptured. And so then moving into the next slides, on the top there, you can see the sightings we received of pigs that resembled Eurasian wild boar. 
But we were really relieved to see that we didn't have a lot of Eurasian wild boar on the landscape. And something that Maureen chatted about earlier in the presentation is that these Eurasian wild boar really have those ancestral features of pigs. So they're really well adapted to surviving and reproducing in the natural landscape. And so we're quite keen on following up on these sightings and we are relieved that we don't have more of them in the province. And then of course, on the bottom slide, you can see there was a number of pigs where we couldn't determine what type of pig it was. Um, and those are just sightings, you know, where we didn't have a photo or we couldn't verify it, something like that. Uh, but in general, there were a number of sightings of wild pigs across the province. And I think one other note that I wanted to make here is that the majority, majority of sightings that we received across all pig types were of individual pigs. So it was a single pig or a very small group of pigs. And this is a good thing. I think Maureen may have mentioned that wild pigs, when they are established and breeding on the landscape, they naturally congregate into sounders. So a sounder is just a fancy word for a group of pigs. And usually that's made up of one or two sows and one or two generations of offspring. So you can have a group of pigs, typically a small sounder would be, you know, six, maybe six individuals in size, but they can get up into like the twenties and thirties and things like that. So because we just have individual or mostly individual pigs on the landscape, um, we are assuming that we don't have any established um, breeding populations of wild pigs in Ontario today. And that's a really good thing. And we'll go on to the next slide. <laughs> Perfect. So this slide shows the textbook sort of example of an invasion curve for an invasive species. And so, you know, you start off, you'll be surprised on the far left of the figure there. First of all, the species is absent and then it's introduced and you have these small local numbers uh, in populations. And then rapidly you kind of hit up over that invasion curve as you see that um, reproduction and spread uh, until at the very end, so on the far right hand side there, that's where uh, the species is very well established and oftentimes eradication is off the table and any type of management you're doing is just to try and manage or keep those numbers as low as possible. And so, as I said, we don't have established um, breeding populations of wild pigs here in Ontario. And so you can see Ontario is here <laughs> in that figure. And so really we're at this early um, preventative stage. So we really want to address this problem head on and prevent wild pigs um, from becoming established in the province. We don't want to get to where um, the figure indicates where Saskatchewan is, right? Where you have that explosive population growth and management is becoming very costly. and some researchers have even said that, you know, in Saskatchewan, they're getting to beyond that point of when they could actually eradicate wild pigs from the natural environment. And they may be left with just really managing and trying to keep numbers as low as possible. So back to you, Maureen. Gotta find the unmute button again, sorry. Um, thanks, Ray, that was great. So um, as Bree's already, started to talk about control challenges with wild pigs are numerous. Uh, uh, NDM and RF has done a lot of work uh, talking to other jurisdictions who have much more experience with this, who've been handling it for you know years or even decades sometimes, uh, and other areas where they've had successful eradication programs. And there have been a number of lessons that we've gleaned from these other uh, other groups, uh, including, of course, the value of early detection and quick response, right? So the sooner we get these guys off the landscape, the less chance there is that they will actually become established. But wild pigs in particular, really tricky to control because, because they have such a high reproductive rate, you need to eliminate 70 to 90% of the population annually just to keep it under control, right? That's not even necessarily going to get rid of it. We, you need to eliminate at least 90% of the population or they're just gonna keep growing. That would basically keep it stable. Um, there's all kinds of different methods for trying to control pigs, many of which they use in the US that we would not um, be able to use in Canada. So in the US, for example, they organize um, helicopter hunts uh, where they will actually shoot pigs uh, from a helicopter. So they'll they'll fly out over an area where they know there's a big sounder and basically spend two to three days shooting hundreds of pigs to try to get them out of a particular area. There's also been a lot of work uh, in terms of uh, using poisons to control them as pests. Um, that obviously has a lot of uh, complications with it. It has to be a humane means of killing the pigs. And also you have to make sure that whatever toxin you are using 
um, is not accessible to non-target species, right? Because you want to make sure you're only el eliminating the pigs, basically. So um, it is complicated. There are areas uh, where they use this uh, in the United States and also in Australia, uh, but not something that is uh, currently permissible or um, or in use in Canada by any means. And then there's um, trapping the pigs. And uh, what they use is what's called whole sounder removal. And that is the best way to get rid of these animals because um, it means you're not making, because, because they are so smart, if you either trap some of the pigs or you hunt some of the pigs, um, the other animals in the group get really smart um, and they learn to avoid traps and they learn to avoid people particularly people with guns. Um, and you actually make them smarter and you drive them into other areas and you actually end up expanding their range instead of actually reducing the population and the area they're, um, they're inhabiting. So the, the rule of thumb is if you're doing these campaigns is to leave no pig behind. And that brings me to uh, discussion of sport hunting in particular, um, which often comes up when you're talking about control of wild pigs, because as I've mentioned already, uh, there are some people who really like the idea of hunting pigs. They're, they're, they're effectively, they're a dangerous animal, as I said, poor man's gri grizzly, um, but that appeals to a lot of people to be hunting a dangerous animal, right? Um, and of course, and they're a good size animal, you can eat them, like there's, there's lots of appeal there. But um, as I said, when they're exposed to hunting pressure, they learn to avoid humans, they disperse into new areas and they continue to reproduce. So it's actually counterintuitive, but allowing sport hunting of pigs because it only eliminates a very small percentage of the population actually makes the whole issue worse. And this slide um, is uh, from, I believe, the Tennessee Wildlife Department. And it shows a great example of how hunting pressure actually expands wild pig populations. So, oh, all right, that's not what I, there we go. So uh, over about 50 years, right, there was no hunting statewide um, as per regulations. Um, it was only permitted in areas where there were known populations. So this is what we had here. And then over basically 50 years, right? You go, you go, you go. There's some range expansion, but the, the pigs, the areas that are infested are still fairly well contained. Uh, and then 1999, they authorized statewide year round, no limit hog hunting. And so everybody, there were a few people who thought this is great. And they actually got pigs and took them to other areas and released them so that they could hunt them more widely. And here's what happened in just over 10 years, which is pretty spectacular when you consider how destructive these animals are. So that's a perfect example of how sport hunting is actually bad for population control when it comes to wild pigs. And I'll send it back over to Bree to talk about some of the things we're doing here in Ontario about wild pigs. Yes, for sure. Thanks, Maureen. So I talked a little bit about our citizen science approach to learn more about the number and locations and types of wild pigs that are on the landscape. And so that's probably the main thing that we have that we have launched. Um, what we're also doing is um, now we've extended exp expanded that pilot, sorry, so that we're actually doing more follow up on the ground. So we're continuing to collect sightings, we're continuing to be interested in where wild pigs are. And then um, in certain instances, we're following up by conducting interviews and having conversations with residents. Sometimes we're learning a lot about, you know, is this a single incidence of a wild pig sightings or maybe there's uh, a reoccurring problem with wild pigs in a certain area. Uh, we're also setting up trail cameras and baiting stations. So we're actually trying to lure those pigs in so that we can learn more, for example, about how many are in a group or um, what type of pig it is. And then in certain situations, uh, particularly when the pigs pose a high risk of becoming established and self-sustaining in the natural environment, we actually use those corral traps that Maureen described. And we do trap uh, either if it's a single pig, the single pig, or else the sounder or the entire group of pigs, and we do remove them as necessary. And um, my colleagues in science and research branch have also, you know, they've done a number of different spin-off projects as well. So they've looked at the relationships between the number of sightings we've been receiving uh, and the, the number of communications that have been la um, launched. 
They've also done some really neat research on and modeling on determining the sources or the likely source of wild pigs in Ontario. They investigated a few different hypotheses, you know, are could pigs be coming in from neighboring jurisdictions, for example, from Manitoba or Quebec or New York? They looked at, you know, whether if there were breeding populations here in Ontario, could that be a source? And the main hypothesis or finding that they found was that the majority of wild pigs that we do have or that we are finding on the landscape um, are very likely to have come from, from within Ontario from escapes and releases. They've also done some modeling for African swine fever, which of course is top of mind for a number of people for the reasons that Maureen mentioned earlier. Okay, and so in addition to this research and on the ground follow-up, we're also looking at the policy and regulatory tools that, um, that we could use to help address the problem, the wild pig problem here in Ontario. And I won't get into a ton of detail on this, but I, I am excited to share some of the work that we're doing. So probably the uh, most significant policy work that we've done is we've developed a draft strategy to address the threat of wild pigs in the province. And um, as a complement to that strategy, we also have um, put up a regulatory proposal for wild pigs. And that proposal would actually regulate pigs as an invasive species under the Invasive Species Act. So just one quick note is that I mentioned it's a draft strategy and it's a regulatory proposal. And both of those um, proposals were available through the Environmental Registry of Ontario for public comment. And for those who aren't familiar, the Environmental Registry of Ontario is it's an electronic database that really stores and lists all of the proposals and decisions on environmentally significant issues here in the province. It also facilitates the ability to, for the public, to um, engage and provide input on those topics. Um, so, so back to the strategy. So what the strategy is, is the strategy really develops the goal of being proactive, right? So we don't want wild pigs. We don't want the wild pig problem here in Ontario. And now is the time to act uh, if we are going to prevent these populations from establishing in the province. I mentioned that one of the main tools that the strategy talks about is actually regulating pigs as an invasive species. And, and what we'd be able to do through that regulation is actually put a number of different prohibitions in place. Uh, examples of the proposed prohibitions are, for example, we could make it illegal to release any pig into the natural environment. Uh, and that would encourage people to, you know, of course, keep their pigs contained. And it would also head off any issues with, you know, intentional releases. We have also proposed to phase Eurasian wild boar out of the province over a two year period. And again, that really gets to the issue of those surface, um, specific ancestral um, survivorship characteristics that Eurasian wild boar do have, particularly when they are being crossbred uh, either in captivity or in the landscape with domestic pigs. Uh, we also have proposed prohibiting hunting of wild pigs here in Ontario, again, exactly for the reasons that Maureen uh, explained. And another commitment that the action, or sorry, that the strategy includes is to continue with the ongoing monitoring of sightings and those on the ground removal efforts of wild pigs. And of course, um, this is a cross cutting issue. I think a good example of that or a demonstration is the fact that Maureen and I are here today presenting um, from partner ministries. So we really do need to con continue to collaborate. We know that no single ministry government, um, stakeholder or partner can really tackle this issue alone. So we are collaborating and sharing information and resources both with, um, within and between governments. We are also working um, very closely with non-government agencies, um, including you know, conservation organizations, as well as uh, agricultural groups and, and so on. And also I should mention that we're also collaborating and sharing information a lot with folks from other provinces and territories, as well as the federal government, and of course, working a lot and learning a lot from the wild pig problem in the United States as well. And I just wanted to give a little bit of a, a shout out here. There are a number of different valuable resources that have been produced, uh, including some fact sheets from OMAFRA about you know, responsible pig ownership and how to keep your pigs contained. There's also um, some resources from Ontario Pork, which is an agricultural stakeholder, as well as um, some information on pet pig ownership, which was produced by Swine Health Ontario, and also the wild pig trail camera detection protocol, which was developed by Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. Okay, and um, communication. So communications has been really key in all of the work that we've been doing. 
um, not only that's been just contributing to our pilot, but also getting the word out around wild pigs as an invasive species and what is the wild pig problem. So our ministry has launched a number of different resources. We've really worked with both traditional media through um, helping support articles in local newspapers, as well as magazine articles. Anyone who follows our ministry on social media um, would have seen lots of posting on wild pigs, especially you know, communicating key messages, such as encouraging folks to report their sightings to the ministry. We've also developed and distributed a fact sheet uh, that includes a lot of information on wild pigs, both within Ontario, as well as just in general. And we also developed a uh, web page, a government web page, which not only includes information on wild pigs, um, that, sorry, wild pigs in general, but it also includes information and links to, for example, reports that we've um, developed that share information on the sightings that we've received and also some of the research that's been ongoing and links to the wild pig strategy and so on. Perfect. Thanks, Bree. So, I want to make sure we have enough time for questions, so I'm just going to go through a couple of slides really quick here. There's um, some great comms campaigns that, again, because the U.S. has been dealing with this problem for so long, uh, USDA has some great um, videos about wild pigs in different states, and um, if you have any interest in this topic, I'd encourage you to watch them. They're fairly short. I think they're... Mm, you know, eight or 10 minutes each, but really interesting to see the impact that these animals have um, on people in those different areas. And, you know, not just on farmers, but even on hunters and that sort of thing in terms of, you know, what pigs do to biodiversity in any given area and so on and so forth and their impacts on other species that are important to those different groups. And one particular campaign called Squeal on Pigs um, was I believe originally uh, developed in Montana and has been actually adapted by, uh, adopted rather by a number of different jurisdictions, including Alberta, to again try to encourage people to report these sightings because it is absolutely essential that we have as many eyes on the ground as possible to be able to find these pigs so that they can be removed um, from the landscape. And there's some examples of what the squeal on pigs um, campaign actually looks like and some of the little messages, right? Protect our water our, and our land from feral pigs. It's not just about crops or anything like that. This is a cross-cutting issue that affects everybody from agriculture to conservationists and beyond. So, um, and I'll just briefly say, instead of going through this whole slide, um, Bree already mentioned OMAFRA has a really great info sheet on dealing with escaped livestock. It's not even specific to pigs, but of course does include pigs. Um, and again, there are things you can do um, as a member of the public to help get these animals off the landscape as expediently as possible. Even if the pig isn't a Eurasian wild boar, remember they can all interbreed. The fewer pigs we have on the landscape, um, the better it is for everybody in terms of making sure these populations do not get established because it doesn't take much to go down that, or rather, I suppose, up that invasion curve um, very, very quickly with these animals. So remember, wild pigs are an invasive species in Ontario. They do not belong here. They have been um, quoted as an ecological train wreck waiting to happen um, with risks to people, livestock agriculture, plant agriculture, and entire ecosystems. And in Ontario, especially now is the time and our opportunity to prevent these animals from becoming established in our landscape. Uh, it requires a really coordinated One Health effort, including lots and lots of communication. Again, eyes on the ground. Um, as Bree mentioned, a lot of our a lot of the animals in Ontario are from escapes, so we effectively need to turn off the tap. Right, we need to make sure that we're not allowing more pigs to get onto the landscape, and we can deal with the ones that are already there. Farm biosecurity is really important for agriculture to make sure that pigs stay in when they're supposed to stay in and pigs stay out when they're supposed to stay out. So we're not transmitting disease between the two. Um, and of course, investigating those, particularly those high risk sightings and getting the highest risk animals off the landscape ASAP, which um, NDMNRF has been doing a great job on. And with that, Brian, I would be happy to take any questions. 